But short duty ended up being Vietnam. <laughs> I jokingly say I was in the Navy for about 13 weeks and the rest of the time I was attached to the Marine Corps. But uh, we did regular Navy boot camp and uh, learned how to tie knots and how to march and all that other stuff that goes with boot camp and uh, learned all about the sailor's life and what we were going to expect. And then suddenly after boot camp, I am attached to a, a CB battalion which is in turn attached to the 3rd Marine Division. Of course in boot camp, because you had people from all over the nation in your boot camp company. And then they carried forward into your battalion even more so, because you had people from the back east, you had people from out west, you had people, we even had a few Canadians in our battalion. Uh, first deployment was to uh, Dong Ha, Vietnam. And Dong Ha was uh, positioned at about five five miles south of the DMZ in the northern i Corps, and we were about 15 miles inland from the South China Sea. We built literally everything and anything. We could move into a, a piece of bare land and build a city if, if necessary. The first job that we did in our battalion was to construct an air-conditioned morgue for the Marine Corps. That way they could move their operation into a better environment for it for everyone involved. And it was a large supply base for the Northern Iron Corps. I was company clerk. And uh, I was able to work in a fairly good environment. We started out in a in a tent for an office, and then we moved into a, a semi-trailer. Uh, and the uh, interesting thing is that uh, there were no desks available, there were no chairs available, so we, we had to make them. So we made our own wood out of shipping crates or whatever we had on hand. And then uh, as things began to get built on our campsite, there was a large uh, metal building erected that housed uh, the two uh, mechanics shops the heavy equipment and the uh, lighter equipment shops. We built that office and we, we got a little assistance from the Air Force for uh, our material and supplies. When I say assistance, they weren't necessarily aware of it, but uh, they did contribute a tremendous amount of equipment and supplies for us. And uh, we were within range of North Vietnamese artillery. And we were constantly harassed by NVA artillery, rockets and mortars, and ground troops that uh, were attempting to uh, discourage us from doing what we were doing. <laughs> we were hit 95 times during our uh, first deployment there. And that deployment was from May to the 1st of December. You know, you're always on edge, you're always, waiting for the next rocket or next artillery or next whatever to happen. It could happen any time, day or night. And uh, of course there was very, very little warning that it was, it was coming. And, uh, and we had bunkers strategically placed all over our campsite in our work zones. And uh, uh, we made use of them many times. We got the word from the dispatcher that uh, the skipper's on his way, and about, boom, about that time, the first round hit, set off that ammo dump. We initially were about an eighth of a mile from the ammo dump, and the, the blast and concussion from those explosions, there were 500 pound bombs in there, there were small arms, there was phosphorus grenades, and it, it was just uh, unreal. It was so intense that it was sucking the oxygen out of the air. And the heat from the fire was just overwhelming. We were underground in bunkers, fortunately. And uh, there was way more men in those bunkers than they were designed for. Later on in the afternoon, things kind of quieted down and we, uh, there was a, a deuce and a half truck 
parked out here close by, and it had been running all this time, idly. We all piled on the deuce and a half and drove it about a half a mile away to where our living hooches were. And we went down into our bunkers at our hooches because we didn't know what was going to happen. All scrunched up in that bunker, uh, it was just a trench in the ground with a, a cover over the top of it. Um, I, all my extremities went numb and it came, finally they gave us an all clear. We could come out of the bunkers and blood started circulating. Well, my little finger felt like someone had uh, smashed it. I mean, it was horribly painful. It was swelled up big. So the next day I went to sick bay and uh, the doctor looked at it and he said, well, you've got to, you must have some kind of an infection there. We're going to drain it. So they sliced it open and exposed the, the bone and drained the finger. And he sent me back on regular, regular duty. Next day I was filling sandbags with sand from the river, which the river was used for the sewer. I developed an infection, serious infection, which turned into gangrene. Our battalion doctor was trying to treat it and uh, wasn't having much success. And finally he said, I'm gonna to have to medevac you. You need some better care than that. And they flew me to Fubai. And it was, uh, the siege of Kantian was going on at that time. And that was, it was being overrun and Marines were amassing a lot of casualties. Of course, they had priority over me. I was still ambulatory. And there was a, a priest walking around giving last rites. And he spotted me and says, come help me. He said, you at least got one good arm because I was in a sling with my bad arm. I finally got to see a doctor and the surgeon said, well, you need to be here at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. We're gonna take your arm off. And uh, he showed me where he, matter of fact, he took a ballpoint pen and drew a mark where he's gonna cut it, leave a stub. So he got, he, I remember him saying, we can put a prosthesis on that. And he says, you'll be fine. He says, your war's, your war's over. You're gonna, you'll be going home. But he said, be here tomorrow morning. We gotta take that arm off. So I went back to the ward and there was a Navy corpsman in charge. And he looked at me and he said, what are they gonna do? And I said, they're gonna take my arm off. And he said, there's a medevac plane leaving at 0600 tomorrow morning. And he turned around and walked off. And I thought a little bit, and I started to ask him, he said, I didn't say anything. He denied he said it. Well, six o'clock that next morning, there was that airplane out there. It was being loaded with med medevac personnel. And they were stacking litters five high in that C-130 cargo hold. I got on board. There's four seats in that aircraft to sit on. There was four nurses. I took one of the seats. They, they closed the doors of the aircraft, were taxiing to the runway. Uh, the captain, the head nurse, approached me. She said, what are you doing on my airplane? And I started to tell her, and she got closer, and she sniffed. She says, I know what your problem is. I can smell it. Well, gas gangrene has got a, an odor. And uh, she said, there's a specialist in Da Nang, but we're going to Japan. I said, OK. She said, do you have any orders, any paperwork? I have nothing. I'm just on the airplane. How'd you get on here? I said, oh, I just took a chance. And the plane landed at Da Nang. I was escorted off by two MPs. Thought, I'm probably going to the stockade. They probably got me AWOL, whatever. They dropped me off at an Air Force hospital. And I eventually get treatment about three o'clock the next morning. I'm the only guy in that hospital that's ambulatory. And uh, I'm lighting cigarettes for men who had no arms. And there were some badly burned people. There were some badly wounded people. And then they shipped me to Cameron Bay to a, an army hospital. I was there for 30 days and treatment with antibiotics and soaps and treatment and so forth and whatever. I'm released and I hitchhiked 
back to my unit. <laughs> and I show up to my duty station, walk into my office, and they says, where you been? Oh, that's right, you got met up there. Here again, no paperwork, no records, nothing. And uh, like I had been, been gone for a weekend. <laughs> bizarre, v Vietnam was bizarre. <laughs> One of the least desirable watches was uh, a listening post watch. Because that usually meant you were by yourself, you were out in the middle of nowhere, sitting there on a pile of sandbags. I've got a 45 caliber pistol, because I'm a company of radiomen, so I'm assigned a radio anyway, so during combat operations, uh, that's what I did. I, I was company radioman. And I had, was instructed to uh, maintain radio silence unless something serious happened. And uh, then be, be very discreet, be very careful. So I th thought I heard a bugle call way off in the distance. But I wasn't sure, maybe I had dropped off a nap, dropped off asleep, I don't know. You think about Vietnam, it's dark. Uh, the only light you have is the stars and the moon, and uh, it's quiet, so sound carries a long distance. I heard it again a little bit later, then I heard an answering call. So I said, well, that's kind of weird, so I called it in. I woke up the whole Northern I Corps, or at least it woke up. I don't know whether I woke it up or not, but it woke up, and there was everything from artillery to to uh, jet aircraft, to uh, napalm, to whatever was going on south of us about, I'm guessing about three miles. And of course, I sat there in my post the rest of my watch, just watching what was going on. It was kind of like 4th of July. It was pretty exciting. But I never knew what, what transpired until about 36 years later, I was at a battalion reunion in Branson, Missouri, and Lorraine and I sat down with a couple we didn't know and introduced ourselves. And then he said he served as battalion radioman during combat operations. I said, well, that's interesting. I was a company radioman during combat operations. And he says, what was your call sign? I said, Legend Alpha 6 and he dropped his fork. He said, you were Legend Alpha 6? I said, yeah. He said, do you remember the bugles? And I said, well, yeah. He said, uh, do you know what that was all about? I said, no. He said, man, you made history that night. He said, you should be in the book. I said, what are you talking about? He said, that was the, that was a verification of regimental strength of the NVA, North Vietnamese Army, that were massing up to make an attack on Dong Hall Combat Base, the base where I was at. And he says, you're the first one that heard the bugles and reported it. And they used bugles to communicate. And what all the various battalions were, were massed up in different areas, apparently, the way I understand their, their uh, technique, and uh, that was a signal to move forward. I might have been 23, 24 years old, 25 in Vietnam for the first tour, but I wasn't all that mature. I hadn't grown up yet, and Vietnam made a man out of me. I think that, that molded who I am and what I became.